If you're going to be a good Pokemon player, then you need to understand the properties of different Pokemon. Here's my favorite Pokemon when I used to play Charmander. We need to understand what's his type. He's a fire type. What's his, uh, his size, height and weight? What is his HP, his health points, which is not here? His speed, his accuracy, things of that sort. Similarly, if you're going to be a good chemist, you need to understand the properties of the elements with which you're going to be doing chemistry. Things like their type. Are they metals, non-metals, or metalloids? What's their atomic radius? What's their electron affinity and electronegativity? If you're going to be a good chemist, you need to understand these things. So in this video, we're going to begin the journey into understanding the properties of atoms. And we begin by talking about the atomic and ionic radii of elements. So let's get started. Our formal objectives are the following. We'd like to be able to explain the trends in atomic radii across periods and down groups as well. And secondly, we'd like to be able to understand how losing or gaining electrons changes the radii of atoms. That's how, how do ionic radii compare to atomic radii. So let's begin with this first thing about atomic radii. What's the definition? of an atomic radius. An atomic radius is basically just a measure of the size of the atom. But it's a bit hard to, to define exactly, right? Because an atom consists of a, a nucleus and one or more electrons orbiting or going around that nucleus. What exactly is the size of this atom? Well, there are different ways to define it, but we can basically define some kind of boundary shape and say that the distance from the nucleus to the edge of that boundary shape is the atomic radius, okay? And that's one way to define the atomic radius. But you probably won't be asked to define it on the IB. Now, what are the trends in atomic radius? This is what you're going to be held responsible for. You remember this picture, hopefully. This should look familiar to you. We remember that the period tells us the number of shells in, uh, that an element contains. And the group tells us the number of valence electrons. So for example, we take carbon here. Carbon has two shells and it has four valence electrons by virtue of it being in group 14. Okay, now this picture I've shown you or I've been showing you in, in previous videos does not accurately describe the atomic trends in, in, in radii. So let's modify it a little bit and now this should work. So if we go across a period, we can see that atomic radius tends to decrease, right? So going from lithium to beryllium, boron, uh, carbon and so on, we can see there's a slight decrease in that size. And going down a group, we can see that atomic radius tends to increase. Now, how do we define, how do we explain the, these trends? That's what you're going to be held responsible for in the IB. Let's take the first one, the decrease across the period. There are two, there are two important things you might, you, you, you'd be expected to, to give when, when asked to explain this. The first is that the nuclear charge is increasing across the period. So beryllium has four protons in its nucleus. Boron has five, carbon has six. And because that nuclear charge is increasing, the electrons are pulled in closer. The electron cloud is pulled in closer. So we have negatively charged electrons, right? Orbiting a nucleus. What's holding them close to the nucleus? It must be the protons in that nucleus, that positive charge. And the number the here, the atomic number, tells us how many protons. So the more protons, the more those electrons are pulled in and therefore the smaller the atom as we go across. Now the other important thing is that even though we're adding more electrons, here we go two, three, four, five, you might think, oh, more electrons, more space, but the additional space taken up by those electrons is minimal because they're being added to the same shell. Okay, so two important things, nuclear charge is increasing, and although we're adding electrons, the electrons are added to the same shell, and therefore we don't have a large increase in or we don't have any increase at all in size. We have a reduction in size. So that's the explanation for the decrease across a period. Let's look now for the increase down a group. This one is a bit more obvious and intuitive. The first thing you notice is that the number of shells is increasing. So new shells are added. And because uh, these new shells are going to, are, are, are being repelled by the electrons beneath, okay, then they take up more space. So it's important to mention that even though the new shells are being added, the actual electrons don't take up that much space. Electrons are really tiny. The main thing that's taking up space is this repulsion. 
Okay, so it's due to the repulsion from shells below that we end up taking up space when we add in new shells. Electrons are really tiny. The reason they take up space is because they repel against each other. And the other thing to mention there is that although the nuclear charge is increasing, so if we go from beryllium to magnesium, for example, we have a nuclear charge of 4 here and of 12 there there's shielding of the outer electrons from that nuclear charge. So here we have four, four protons. You would expect that with 12 protons, we pull these electrons in closer than with four protons. But what's happening is that these 12 protons are relatively hidden by these electrons outside. So we have 12 protons, but we have two electrons in this shell and then eight electrons in that shell. So the kind of the effective nuclear charge that these electrons are exposed to would just be what? 2 plus. Because these electrons are shielding or canceling out that charge. So those are the two main trends you need to understand. And if we look at the whole, so what we've been looking at before is just the first 20 elements, but the trend holds more or less for the entire periodic table. If you look, you'll see there are a few discontinuities, but the IB doesn't expect you to, to, to know those. Okay. And the other thing is that the, the actual um, atomic radii and the ionic radii are in your data booklet. We haven't discussed ionic radius yet. We'll discuss it in a second. But the atomic radii are in your data booklet, 10 to the negative 12 meters. So if we take boron here, boron has an atomic radius of 84 times 10 to the negative 12 meters, a really tiny thing. So now I'd say we've gotten an orange light for this first objective. I can explain the trends in atomic radii across periods and down groups. Let's see if we can get a green light by getting some questions right. So here's the first question for you. Which of the following correctly compares the nuclear charge and atomic radii of magnesium and of sodium? Pause the video again, or pause the video as usual, and try to answer this. I'll read through the options quickly. Magnesium has a greater nuclear charge and a larger atomic radius than sodium. Whoops. Magnesium has a greater nuclear charge and a smaller radius. Or does it have a lesser charge, larger radius, or lesser charge and smaller radius than sodium? Again, pause the video. In a few seconds, I will show you a clue. One, two, three. Here's a clue. And in three seconds, I'll show you the answer. One, two, three. Here is your answer. The answer is B. So let's look at these two atoms. We have magnesium here. Where is it? It's magnesium. And we have sodium. Okay. So magnesium, by virtue of it being element number 12, must have a greater nuclear charge. So we're dealing with either A or B. And now, how does, the, how does the greater nuclear charge affect the radius? A greater nuclear charge will pull in the electrons more, and so we should get a smaller radius. So the answer, therefore, must be B. Okay? So we, we said it had a greater nuclear charge, so it could have been A or B, but it has a smaller radius, therefore it is B. Let's look at another one. Similar question, but different elements. Which of these compares the charge and radii of magnesium and calcium? Magnesium has a greater charge and larger radius. Greater charge, smaller radius. Lesser charge, larger radius. Or lesser charge and smaller radius. Again, pause the video and process this. In three seconds, I will show you a clue. One, two, three. Here's your clue. Pause again, make sure you process. In three seconds, I reveal the answer. One, two, three. Here's our answer. Answer is D. So let's look at the magnesium here and uh, calcium. So as you can see, magnesium has one fewer shell than calcium, and it has a lesser nuclear charge. So lesser charge, so it's either C or D, and because it has one fewer shell than calcium, it must be smaller. So it must be a smaller atomic radius than calcium. So that's our answer. Nice and easy. Here's another one. For these, you need to do lots of problems, otherwise you never get it. Arrange the following in increasing order of atomic radius. We have selenium, bromine, and uh, chlorine. Pause the video, try to do it. Selenium, bromine, and chlorine. In a few seconds, I'll show you a clue. Here's our clue. Here's where selenium and bromine would be, but I haven't drawn them. So you need to do kind of the, the use your imagination to think about what they would look like. In three seconds, I'll show you the answer. Make sure you've paused the video and, and worked through it. One, two, three. Here's our answer. Answer is C. So chlorine, selenium, and bromine. Chlorine will have one fewer shell. Therefore, it must be smaller than these other two. Okay. And selenium would have what? A lesser a greater da -da -da. <laughs> a lesser nuclear charge than bromine. So it would be bigger, right? So selenium would have, let's see, here we have three shells. 
So this would have four shells, one, two, three, and then four, okay? And bromine would also have four shells, but those shells will be pulled in more. As you can see, as we go this way across the period, the shells get pulled in more. And so bromine would also have four shells, but those shells will be slightly more compact. Hopefully that is smaller indeed than the selenium one, okay? So the answer is C. So chlorine is the smallest here, and then selenium is the largest, followed by bromine being in the middle. Okay, I'd say now we're green light, if you got all those questions right, in terms of being able to explain the trends in atomic radii across periods and down groups. Let's move on to this next one now about ionic radii. So in order to understand what's going on with ionic radar, we need to recall what happens to elements on the periodic table in terms of their, atom their uh, electronic behavior. We had said that many of these electronic configurations are quite unstable, and there are few, specifically the noble gases, which are particularly stable. And therefore, an element's job in life, or an element's role in life, is to figure out what is the shortest path to the throne, to looking like a noble gas. And if we take something like oxygen, what's its shortest path to the throne? It will jump two steps this way, or rather it won't jump, it will accept two electrons. And if it accepts two electrons, then it looks like neon, and it is happy, all right? And beryllium would wanna go this way, lose two electrons, and then it would look like what? Helium, and be happy. So based on this gain or loss of electrons, we can define types of atoms, metals, metalloids, and non-metals. The metals will generally tend to lose electrons to become like the noble gases. So for example, magnesium here would lose two electrons to become like neon. And then the transition metals, you could say, well, these are technically closer to that side, so why doesn't zinc go in that direction and gain electrons instead of losing all these electrons? And it's a long story for the transition metals. But um, one quick way to remember what's a metal and what's a non-metal is usually the metals end in IUM. So I don't know, beryllium or vanadium or chromium and so on. There, there are a bunch of exceptions like manganese and iron, but um, most of them end in IUM and that's a way to figure out what's a metal. IUM is the word for metal in I think Latin. Now the non-metals on the other hand will tend to what? Gain electrons. So when uh, sulfur forms an ion, it will gain two electrons, dup, dup, and become a two negative ion. The metalloids in the middle tend to uh, go either way, right? And you can remember where the met metalloids are by drawing a staircase here across the periodic table, okay? Sometimes polonium is included in the list of um, metalloids. And then aluminum, you'd have to remember, is not is not a metalloid. You should know that aluminum is a metal. Okay, so now we know how these two types of atoms are going to lose or gain electrons to form ions. The, the, uh, their ionic radii are going to be affected in different ways. Okay, so gaining and losing electrons affects the radius differently. Let's look at an example starting with the anions. What happens when fluorine forms an ion? So here we're going to add an electron to fluorine. What do you expect will happen? Well, that's what happens, all right? So we, we notice that the, the uh, radius has gotten larger, right? So we could write this as a neutral F atom gains an electron to form an F minus ion, right? And what we notice is that F minus, or the anion, is larger than the neutral atom of F. So here's our principle then, the radii of negative ions are larger than their neutral atoms. Why? Due to repulsion. When we added that electron, the added repulsion in that shell pushed the, sh the shell outwards. So we had a larger um, ionic radii than we have atomic, an atomic radius. Okay? So that's the first thing we notice. The second thing we notice is that F minus is, gr is larger than Ne, is larger than neon, even though they have the same number of electrons. And the principle there is that amongst isoelectronic species, isoelectronic means they have the same number of electrons, amongst isoelectronic species, the smaller the nuclear charge, the larger the atom. Smaller nuclear charge here, 
a larger atom. Why is that? Well, if, if the nuclear charge is smaller, then it's less able to pull in those electrons. The reason that the electrons are being held in is that we have protons in there that, that are pulling them closer. And if that proton pulling force is weaker, then they're pulled in less. And so these guys are pulled in less than those guys because here we have nine, just nine protons and then we have 10 protons. So amongst isoelectronic species, a weaker charge gives you a larger atom because the weaker charge is unable to pull in the electrons sufficiently. Let's look at oxygen, another anion. So with oxygen here, we're going to add two electrons, right? Because it'll want to gain two electrons to become like neon. What's going to happen in terms of its size? Think about it. So that's what happens, right? It gets bigger as well. And we form an O2 minus ion. And O2 minus, of course, is larger than O. Why? Because we've added two more electrons, right? And therefore, it has become larger. So again, like I said, the radii of negative ions are larger than their neutral atoms due to repulsion. The other principle we notice is that O2 minus is larger than F minus, which of course makes it also larger than an E. So again, the principle is that amongst isoelectronic species, these are all isoelectronic species, this one, this one, and that one, right? Because this has 2, 8, 2, 8, and 2, 8. Why is this one the biggest? Well, because it has the smallest charge, okay? So the smaller nuclear charge gives you a larger atom. The smallest charge is least able to pull in those electrons. Nice. Let's answer some questions. Arrange the following species in increasing order of radius. Pause the video and think about how you would answer this. In three seconds, I'll show you a clue. One, two, three. Here's our clue. Again, pause. Make sure you feel confident in your answer. In three seconds, I'll show you the answer. Here's our answer. A. Okay. So in increasing order of radius, we have these three, O2 minus, F minus, and NE, this is exactly what we just did, right? And we can see NE is the smallest. Why? Because it has the largest charge. So the charge is pulling in the electrons. And O2 minus is the biggest. So O2 minus is the biggest, and NE is the uh, smallest, and F minus is in the middle. Let's look at another one. Here we have SE2 minus, BR minus, and CL minus. Pause and think about it. In three seconds, I'll show you a clue. One, two, three, here's our clue. So we know chlorine has one fewer shell. Fewer shells means smaller. So chlorine should be the smallest, right? So it's either C or D. And then these two are isoelectronic, which means the one with the larger nuclear charge should be smaller. Or, or the one with the smaller nuclear charge should be larger. Pause the video, make sure you, you can figure out which of those is correct. Three, two, one, here's our answer, D. So this one, Se2 minus, is the biggest. Why? Here's the selenium atom, right? So sel selenide ion would have 34 protons, and the bromide ion would have 35 protons, 